from the second floor of the Duncan Student Center. It is our first ele election coverage of the election season. Austin Rooney, Jackie Fletcher, Julie Randall, and Kean Conroy. We're glad to have you with us. Results from the Iowa caucuses will be moving in in the next 30 minutes to the next hour or so. We will report those live as we get them. But before we even get those results, we have a pretty good idea of where things will stand based on the polling data. Real Clear Politics has their polling average, and we have a look at that to start things off. Bernie Sanders in the lead, and Jackie, what do you see from these numbers? I mean, clearly Sanders is in the lead. Biden, not too far behind. Those are clearly our two top contenders. Obviously, really different in terms of their policies. Biden obviously being the moderate that the Democrats are going out after, whereas Sanders is our more populist candidate. So we'll see if that pulls through tonight. Jilly, what are your thoughts on these polls? Yeah, I completely agree. Clearly, we've seen this big populist movement with Sanders in the lead. I have a feeling a, a lot of us were not expecting him to be pulling through so so early in this election. But um, we're looking forward to seeing where these results come tonight. Kian, a, a question I want to ask you about these Iowa polls. We see a candidate like Amy Klobuchar, someone who is polling as high as 9%. I think an even better example might be Pete Buttigieg. 16.8% in the Iowa averages. Once you look at the national polls, those numbers are much lower. Yeah, that's entirely true. They've done a really good job uh, with grassroots campaigning. They've done a really good job reaching out to people in Iowa specifically. Um, one, of the thing that's, one of the things that's going to be interesting with those candidates in particular is there are going to be a lot of precincts where they don't reach the 15% threshold. So it's going to be interesting to see where their supporters go to other camps. If uh, Klobuchar supporters are going to be more supportive of Biden, to just kind of get a sense of what campaigns are um, really going to be associated in this election? Yeah, we're going to jump into the exact process of how the Iowa caucus actually works uh, in a few minutes here. But first, let's take a look at those national polls. I briefly mentioned them earlier about what those numbers look like. While Sanders leads in Iowa with 23%, it's Biden who leads the national polls with 27 Jilly, what do you see here from the national polls? And how good of an indicator is this for who's going to win the nomination? Look, I think it really comes down to electability for the national role for the national polls because Biden, I think, um, the majority of the nation see as a pure candidate who can beat Trump. He is the one person who everyone has faith. Not extremely different from Sanders, as Jackie was saying, because not as strong um, with the populist aspect of his of his uh, uh, policies. But I think really a lot of the nation just sees him as a solid candidate to get us through the next four years, potentially eight, but most likely four, uh, to just fully beat President Trump. And Jackie, Julie just mentioned that populist aspect. Mm -hmm. How important is that for someone like Bernie Sanders' campaign to run the table and really gain some momentum here? Exactly. I mean, echoing exactly what Jilly said on the national level, I think, you know, the Democrats know Biden has a higher electability than Sanders in terms of the national landscape just because he does have, you know, more left-leaning policies that might be difficult to beat with Trump. But I think, you know, overall with Biden, like, for him, the, the, the electability of him, as Jilly was saying, just really, like, plays a larger role compared to Iowa where the populist vote, he can really get those grassroots campaigns. I know we were talking earlier, he's getting people bussed out. He's really putting in that extra, extra effort in the small area, um, whereas on the national poll, I don't know that it, he could pull that through necessarily toward the end. And Keen, I want to ask you about this. Trump is a pop, was a populist candidate. He won in 2016. Obama, to an extent, also a populist mm -hmm. candidate. He wins in 2008. Does it take a populist like Bernie Sanders to take home the win in 2020 for the Democrats? Uh, you know, that's a really good question. And um, one thing I understand you guys were touching on was the difference between you know Biden's electability and Sanders' populism, and I think um, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how that plays uh, going forward. I think in Iowa specifically, one of the really interesting aspects is that you're going to have um, you're going to have more moderates and more older people showing up at a greater rate, unless the Sanders young progressive base really shows up. And one thing about Iowa is that because of the caucus system, the people who are really active and really passionate about uh, their campaign and about their candidates are going to be the people who have the most sway in those gyms and in those churches and courtrooms. So. Uh, that'll be interesting to see if, if those young people for Sanders, those uh, younger, more liberal people for Warren show up, or if the Biden older, more moderate base sweeps the day. Keen, I want to touch on that again. You talked about the process of the Iowa caucuses. It's a unique system. It's a unique setup. It's not all that much like the primaries you'll see in New Hampshire and many other states. So can you run through what that's all about for us? 
Yeah, so I'll actually give you a brief little history. Um, back in the 18, early 1800s when they started, the caucuses were for party officials to come together and decide who they wanted to lead the party. Uh, going forward, that changed and changed um, over time to have more people from average voters joining in the system. Uh, in the mid-1900s, the Democrats decided to include more people. Um, they decided to switch to more primaries so that more people could just go vote because caucuses take a lot of energy. You have to go in, you have to go and try to convince other people um, to support your candidate for oftentimes several hours, whereas the primaries are a little easier. So the Democrats started to shift towards that. But they left the Iowa caucus intact, and that's really important because it's always the first primary um, to, to be staged. And since 1976, it's always been a major focal point in the election because the person who wins in Iowa gets a good start. Um, so as from the historical context, Democrats typically do much better going forward when they win in Iowa. So then the other thing about this year in particular, and it's happened in past years, it's slightly different this year. My understanding is there are a few different rounds of voting. You have your first round of voting, which is just the general vote, and then different candidates or different voters can side with different candidates to reach a 15% threshold. Can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, so it's a somewhat complicated system. Um, basically, you have different precinct, what they call precinct caucuses, where you have people who are getting together and debating in um, gyms and public spaces. Uh, and that the first round of voting is when people walk in the door, who do they have as their, their candidate? Who are they supporting? The second round is after that first round is um, decided, people can switch. And people whose candidates get below 15% are expected to go to other candidates' camps. So the second round of voting is after, um, after they've decided what candidates people can now choose from, that's typically, typically going to be the top three or four candidates, Everyone who's undecided or everyone has a lower performing candidate is going to have to go join those camps. Uh, and then from there, uh, the different caucuses, they record the percentages, send that to the counties, the counties, and then the counties send delegates to the state convention. So it's really the second, um, the second round of voting that's going to be most important in how the delegates are chosen. But just for the sake of Iowa, Iowa has only 1% of the nation's delegates. So I don't think that the Iowa caucus itself will decide who the nominee is based on its delegates alone. It's big for momentum when we've seen that historically, Jackie. We have. Um, I mean, in terms of thinking about what the Iowa caucus means, um, how seriously should we take this? Since 1972, there have been nine primary seasons um, without a de Democratic incumbent running. So 67% of those times, so essentially two thirds, the Iowa caucus winner ended up being the Democratic nominee. So those are pretty good odds just in terms of picking up that momentum. I mean, typically um, you see the winner take about three percentage point leap after they win this. So that's, there's definitely something to be said for that. Is it the end if you don't win? No, but historically pretty good odds. Well, you talked about that 3% uh, leap that they get. Mm -hmm. Can we get another look at those national polls from Real Clear Politics, see if we can get that back up on the screen for you all because Biden's at 27% there, Sanders at 23. If Sanders mm -hmm. pulls off Iowa, that could be enough to put him in the lead for the national polls. I really think that it could. I mean, you see, it's really this, the Iowa caucus is the first vote of confidence. It's the first test that's really determining momentum. It's the first time you're getting out there seeing like real numbers from people and where that's gonna go. So if that 3% jump could put him there, that momentum keeps carrying forward, you could see that national poll changing. And Julia, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, in the end of, at the end of the day, it's it's horse race polling. People see the so Bernie has the momentum. They're going to want to go with the crowd. They're going to want to follow what the rest of the, the crowd is doing. Um, and they, I think it's our mentality to kind of follow the leader in our society. And the fact that Bernie has gotten so much momentum these past couple months especially, um, that could really, really definitely potentially put him put him in the lead. And I think at the end of Iowa, it's really the top three, like we are saying, that yes, there's kind of a given top two probably, but that third is w really what we're looking for here because that third candidate could potentially spir uh, skyrocket up to the top of these polls. Uh, yeah, ahead, can, can I comment on that? Um, I think for some of the lower performing candidates like Buttigieg, like Klobuchar, this is a go big or go home primary. Um, if Buttigieg fails to win, he's gonna face a couple of caucuses, a couple of primaries coming up in the next month where he's down, uh, he's down below 5% um, amongst in Nevada and South Carolina. So he has to win, win in this and get momentum, or if he loses, it's going to be tough to convince people that he belongs in the race. Well, Kian, let's talk a little bit more about that. How important is this primary for a couple of different candidates? 
Let's start at the very top here with someone like Bernie Sanders. He has very good numbers right now in Iowa. His numbers in New Hampshire are also very promising. If he wins these first two states, it could be crucial, right, Julie? Oh, yeah, 100%. Iowa really sets the sets the stage for the rest of our election season, 100%. And the fact that um, it, it's very, uh, the caucus this year is very different because Bernie Sanders has pushed for the raw votes in, at, out of both rounds to be released as well. So now it's not just based off of percentage, percentages, it's also based off of raw votes, which won't mm -hmm. is not technically the winner of Iowa, but those will be released. So I think it's going to be a little... It, it, they're doing that to be more clear and um, precise and cons uh, to the public, but I think in the end it really could cause a big controversy because uh, some candidates are going to be claiming their victories based off of popular raw votes, um, while other people's are people are going to be focusing on those percentages. Of course, that could be a very big storyline moving forward. I want to talk about a couple of those other candidates. Back to you, Kian. Klobuchar and someone like Pete Buttigieg. How likely are they to continue in this race should they perform poorly tonight? Uh, you know, Austin, that's a great question. Um, that's probably something they're actually considering in their heads right now. Uh, but, you know, uh, both of them have actually had significantly outperformed expectations from the very start, especially Buttigieg. Um, he's, lead he's led several quarters in campaigning over Biden and Sanders that are uh, already national figures. Uh, but I think that's something for... for them to decide that's something for their staffs and um, it's not entirely sure what decisions they're going to make uh, so it's really difficult to say but I think most people in the party if they do not perform well tonight are going to be pressuring them to step out of the race and cede support to someone else so they can start consolidating around a candidate get ready for the general election. And if I could just add something, I mean, you have someone like Bloomberg who entered in at the 11th hour, and he's someone that's skipping these early voting states in hopes of a national campaign that he can run. So, you know, there's always something that could come out of there as well, so you never know. We're going to talk a little bit about Buttigieg, it's not Buttigieg, Bloomberg later in his massive campaign buys to the extent he spent over $300 million is what I saw, which is unbelievable, unprecedented for the primary season. He's we've seen ads all over the place, including the Super Bowl just last night. But I want to continue talking about these Iowa caucuses. Who might be a dark horse? Someone who we didn't think about at the beginning of the night, who you might think is going to pull through big tonight. Jilly, do you have a candidate in mind who you're thinking might come through big, who wasn't in the polls, or maybe wasn't thought to be all that big coming into the night? Honestly, Austin, I would say, uh, I predict it's, I don't think we're going to see someone coming out of the wind here. I think it's quite obvious who our leaders are going to be, specifically Biden. Um, Sanders, potentially Buttigieg, but I really think it is going to be difficult for someone to come out, come to get a victory from this one. And Kia, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I don't think I don't think there's a whole lot of room for dark horses like Yang, uh, like Yang and Steyer to perform well tonight. Uh, but I do think if I, if there's going to be a surprising result, I think it's going to be that Warren drastically underperforms and Sanders drastically overperforms. They've done a great job at getting people out getting people involved in the campaign. Um, if there's going to be a surprise, I think it's going to be Sanders walks away with a big win. We are still awaiting results for Iowa and where we are looking right now. There are some updates from some reporters around Iowa, some people who are performing a little better than thought. Bernie Sanders is doing pretty well on a couple of caucuses. Uh, Joe Biden is supposedly not going to reach 15% in every caucus. Apparently in Johnston, which is a uh, town or a county in Iowa, he is not performing all that well, not reaching the required 54 supporters to get to 15%. That's from Reed Epstein uh, reporting from Iowa. So Biden, maybe his numbers are down a little bit. I want to talk about Joe Biden and what that report could mean. If Joe Biden underperforms tonight, what does that mean for him and his campaign moving forward, Jackie? I mean, I think that goes back to what we were saying earlier before that even rolled in. I mean, if he isn't even getting these numbers now, and if Sanders is going to drastically outperform, as Kian said, if, you know, that which kind of looks like it right now, he does get those upper percentage points, like we were saying earlier, that momentum carries forward, is Biden all of a sudden the best candidate nationally even? Not even just in terms of these small grassroots efforts, but in terms of electability, I mean, is Sanders just going to take the cake at this point? What are your thoughts, Julie? Yeah, and I think a big part portion of this uh, decision has to do with voter turnout age-wise. Mm -hmm. I think, obviously, Sanders has the young votes, and if they turn out, he could easily take this win in, in Iowa. And 
I believe it was uh, Sanders who said, I think yesterday, that if they have the turnout, they will win, and if they don't, they will lose. And I really think that is the uh, thin line Sanders is walking on with his voter turnout. And if it's more young people, uh, it's definitely going to be Sanders. But if, if uh, the older uh, middle-aged gen uh, generation turns out stronger, it's going to be Biden. I would like to interrupt us in this conversation briefly. We have our first numbers from the first alignment from Johnson. We just mentioned this earlier. Sanders was 76, Klobuchar 75, Buttigieg 70, Warren 59, not viable. Biden at 37, a strong performance from Yang at 33, and then Steyer and Gabbard both with four. So those numbers are very promising, especially for Klobuchar. Klobuchar's numbers coming into the night those original Iowa polling numbers, if you can get those back on the screen, that'd be terrific. He had just about, she had just about 9% nationally. She ranks second overall from this town. Now, that again is not necessarily indicative of what would happen in the rest of the state, Kean. You know, these numbers will vary, right? You see Klobuchar there at 9%. Just because she's performing well in one precinct or one town does not necessarily mean she's gonna perform well across the entire state. Yeah, uh, definitely. And the other thing about Klobuchar specifically is that she's probably going to do better with older, uh, more moderate Democrats who are looking for a pragmatic candidate. Um, she's also, she um, really pushes her Midwestern roots strongly, uh, which I think is probably going to work out more in the rural areas. And I think the rural areas are very likely to, um, to report earlier because their caucuses are going to be a little smaller. So I think as the night goes on, we're going to get more caucuses from major metropolitan areas that have hundreds and hundreds of people that take a longer time to sort through um, that are going to go more heavily for the other candidates like Sanders, who, have, who has more younger uh, progressive people. Well, let's run through each of the candidates now. We've talked quite a bit about what this Iowa caucus could bring. I want to go about 60 seconds here on each candidate. Give everybody a reason why each candidate may be uh, enticing for some voters. What's the real draw? And let's start at the very top of the national polls with Joe Biden. What does he really bring to this race that could excite voters that could make voters want to vote for him. And Jackie, let's start with you. Yeah, so I think, as we were saying earlier, in terms of electability, quote unquote, for lack of a better word, demographically, he kind of matches Trump, which is a compelling story in the face of the national election. Um, definitely, when faced against Sanders, against Warren, not so much Buttigieg, um, not so much like some of the other candidates, but he really kind of walks that fine line in terms of maybe being able to get a swing voter. Um, he also has an incredible resume, obviously, the vi former vice president. I think, you know, having that Obama association will definitely help him um, in terms of just experience and his policies, again, more moderate. So I think that's going forward. Kian, what are your thoughts then on Joe Biden? Is, is that draw from President Obama that big? Oh, um, no, it certainly is, particularly for um, the people we more associate with the Obama coalition. Um, so older people and then also with uh, the African-American community, which is probably a little less represented in Iowa than in other states. So uh, I personally think that Joe Biden can take some hits in Iowa tonight, move on. Um, he's re doing really well, really strong in um, the next couple primaries like Nevada and South Carolina that are more represented by, uh, more represented by racial minorities like blacks and Hispanics that have more trust in him because of his association with the Obama administration. Uh, I think that um, I think that he hasn't quite campaigned as heavily in Iowa as the other candidates. Um, so he uh, so Buttigieg has uh, more offices than he does. Um, most of the other candidates have outspent, or most of the other major candidates have outspent Biden in the um, Iowa caucuses in the uh, grassroots campaign. So I think he's more betting on after this getting good results and just hoping that this is just something to add to his resume. Chili, what do you see as the major? Uh, plus for Biden, and, and give us a drawback as well. What is hurting Joe Biden? You know, we've seen him as vice president. What might be a drawback for reasons voters might not really support him? Yeah, I'd say biggest drawback is he's he's not Sanders. I'd say that he he's he's very moderate, and I think our nation right now is obviously with Trump looking for someone who's very polarized, very controversial, and that's exactly not what Biden is. He's moderate, like I said. Also, he's pretty old. If, if he elected for his second term, he would be the oldest standing president. So I definitely think that's a big drawback. Looking at our uh, other list, Boo Judge, Warren, a lot of younger uh, candidacies there. Um, but like they said, I think the Obama um, connection w does help him a lot. And 
we could see the fact that his, his moderate views could potentially help him. Our nation might actually want to take a step away from, from uh, our, polarized, right, our polarization right now. On to Bernie Sanders now. Let's just, let's, let's go right at it. What are the big positives to his campaign? What is drawing support to him, Jackie? I mean, essentially the cornerstone of Bernie Sanders' campaign is his radical, for lack of a better word, radical economic policies. I mean, he's, perf I mean, now a lot of, he's really pulled the party so far left. He came out originally with the $15 minimum wage. Now Warren has it. Now Yang has it. Now Biden even has it. So to be able to take that and really kind of make that the cornerstone of not even your own campaign, but like all of the Democratic nom um, candidates, that's something that's pretty significant. And I think that just his, rationale of like wanting equality for everyone especially for younger people for the millennials who perhaps you know feel like they got left behind i mean it's not dissimilar to what trump did for middle americans for blue collar workers going after that demographic so i think he's doing that but in a different way a quote i've heard said quite a few times is that uh, bernie sanders lost the election in 2016 but he won the party jilly how true is that statement I completely agree with that statement. Like Jackie said, I think honestly Bernie Sanders has single-handedly developed the Democratic Party into what it is today. There's absolutely no way we thought De uh, Bernie Sanders could be uh, as far ahead as he is now if, if we were this time last election. There's just no way. And the fact that he is so far ahead, the, le the left is 100% Bernie Sanders right now. And Kian, I gotta ask you something on the flip side. What are some of the drawbacks that might hurt Bernie Sanders, not only in this primary, but also going into the general election? Uh, so I think same with uh, Biden, his age is definitely a concern. He had a heart attack, um, which most is going to concern a lot of people. Um, other concerns would be, yeah, is what we've talked on is electability. Um, will general election voters, will average Americans um, to support his major policy initiatives, like Medicare for all, uh, like uh, I think he's sp sponsored the wealth the wealth tax that Warren did as well. Um, so that's it's going to be a big debate amongst Democrats if they want to go with a moderate who's more electable or a progressive who who really more inspires a strong base. So we'll see. I think that um, questions of his electability um, are going to plague him, and then a lot of insider Democrats are not big fans of the Biden campaign, or the, my apologies, the Sanders campaign because of how 2016 ran. Um, so I expect some Democratic insiders are gonna be trying to work against him. All right, we got a game coming up here for the next seven candidates. Each get 10 seconds to give us your views on the either the pos positives or drawbacks on each of these candidates, right? 10 seconds is your cap. We're gonna go down the list of where everybody is polling from first to last from here on out. Warren is next. We're going to start with Jackie. Go. You have 10 seconds. Honestly, I think she's a Sanders wannabe. Her whole thing is breaking up big corporate America. Bill Gates even went against her. I mean, I don't really know where we go with that. She wants to slash the defense budget, ban fracking. She wants Medicare for all. I just don't see what differentiates her. Joey. Agreed. I think she's a Sanders copycat. Um, she also, when I think of Warren, I just think of anger. I think she doesn't present herself well in the debate stage, and I don't think uh, the nation's going to like that. Can you, can you give us a positive from Warren? <laughs> Um, I actually don't think that she's a Sanders copycat. I think she's taking a different kind of view. She's less of a socialist um, that the, about socialist that Sanders is and more about how can we make markets work a little better. So I think she's taking a different angle and she's attracting different people, more educated, middle-aged people. Sanders is more progressive, socialist young people. Next up, Pete Buttigieg. Let's reverse direction. Back to Kian. What are your thoughts? Uh, Pete Buttigieg, he's young, he's inspiring, um, he's, he's brilliant, and he reminds people of what they really want to see in this country. His, his rhetoric just, just sparks something, in, something in, in people's minds, especially liberals, about hope and optimism. Buttigieg is young, he's, he's, he's got the stamina, he's incredibly eloquent with his words. I really think the nation could use Pete Buttigieg right now. Well, Jackie, we've seen a couple of positive remarks. Give us some drawbacks on Pete. Yeah, I mean, I would echo what they said about the positives. But, I mean, in terms of drawbacks, let's see. I mean, he, he worked for McKinsey. That kind of came back to bite him with some of the things that he did that isn't really consistent with some of his policies, kind of like practicing what you preach. Um, and also, he is a little bit more moderate. He opposes Medicare for all, although he does support expanded coverage. So I wonder if some of his more moderate policies aren't capturing that base. I've heard a couple of people also criticizing Mayor Pete Buttigieg for not quite diving into the policies as much, focusing on some platitudes. We'll see if that comes back to haunt him as well. Next up, 
Bloomberg, he's an interesting case, not doing all that well in Iowa. Let's start with Julia on this one. What are your thoughts on Mayor Bloomberg? Look, I've, I've never been a large fan of Bloomberg. I, I think he's basically the Trump, but a liberal version. And I, I, I just don't think he's what our nation is going to elect. Um, he doesn't have the electability that a lot of these other candidates have. And I just really don't see it happening. Ken. Um, Bloomberg's interesting. He has a war chest. Donald Trump has made it very clear he's very afraid of him. Uh, and then he's also been able to get get stuff done. His philanthropies are uh, his philanthropies are goal oriented in a way a lot of philanthropies today aren't. And as New York City mayor, he expanded um, healthcare coverage. He moved forward uh, um, he moved forward education bills. Uh, he lowered violence significantly on the streets. Jackie, what are your thoughts on Bloomberg? Uh, I, you know, I see him honestly as the moderate alternative to Joe Biden. I agree with what Jackie and Ke I mean Jackie, I'm Jackie, <laughs> but with what Chile and Kim were saying. Um, but I also think, you know, some of his past policies, stop and frisk, things like that, are going to come back to bite him just because he doesn't have the absolute best record. Um, but he does have the money to support that campaign, so we'll see if that can carry him through a little bit. All right, on to these final four candidates. I'm going to have each of you choose two of them to talk about here. All right, we have to have every candidate covered, all right? And I want you to speak for about 20 seconds on each. Let's cap it to that. Final four candidates you have are Yang, Klobuchar, Steyer, and Gabbard. I want, let's start with you, Jackie. Give me two of those candidates and give me your thoughts on each of them. Okay, well, first I'm going to start with Yang, and I might take my whole 20 seconds on Yang, just because just I, I respect the intellectual capital that he's bringing to this debate, and he's just bringing some really kind of unseen ideas. I mean, he has what's called the Freedom Dividend, which is a universal basic income. Um, I don't really know if that's a sound idea that is still yet to be played out. Um, he does support Medicare for all, human-centered capitalism. So all of these ideas that I think he's bringing, it hasn't gained a lot of traction just because, you know, they're pretty radical and they're more intellectual in nature. But I think that, you know, his background, not as a politician, isn't dissimilar to what Donald Trump did. And I think that people respect that a lot nowadays, especially, you know, having like a real background as an entrepreneur, as a lawyer, things like that. Second candidate really quickly. Uh, I mean, Klobuchar, I think, you know, these numbers, I didn't really expect her to come to come out like this, but I think that she also has a compelling story, you know, like we were saying earlier, like Midwest roots, things like that, so we'll see how she does tonight. Julie, who are your two candidates you're uh, going with? I, I was also going to choose those two, <laughs> um, but I agree. I think the appeal that Yang has, uh, not with a pol political background, uh, he's an entrepreneur, I think that is very attractive to the American public. But again, I don't think he's he's got that it factor that need that one needs to be elected president of the United States. Ian, let's we have to get the other two here: Steyer and Tulsi Gabbard. Who? What are your thoughts on the two of them? We the other two have been covered now, so we're down to the last one here. Yeah, um, I do not know for the life of me why Tulsi Gabbard is still in this race. Um, <laughs> it I think it, it'll be interesting to see if, if really anyone shows out for her. Um, I think that. Her priorities should probably be stepping out, seeding support for someone else, uh, and then figuring out where she's going to go in her own career. Um, with Steyer, I think he's largely forgotten or moved past Iowa. Obviously, he still has fundraising. He still has offices in Iowa. But he's focused a lot of his attention on these uh, primaries coming up, Nevada, South Carolina. And he's actually polling really well in comparison to the other candidates. Um, so I think he's betting that people are going to forget I Iowa and that an early investment in um, the caucuses and primaries to follow is going to pay dividends. I'll give a brief defense of Tulsi Gabbard. Uh, <laughs> I think that her, her main campaign was generally the anti-war ideas, and uh, she's doing better in New Hampshire, polling around 5 6% uh, in some of those polls in New Hampshire. So I'd, I'd imagine she's staying in for that, and then she'll step on out uh, thereafter. Okay, we don't have much time left. Just about one minute remaining on the clock. So we're going to get one really quick question in. Who is the most electable candidate? Who's got the best chance against Trump? You have five seconds apiece. Start with you, Jackie. Oh, uh, you know, that's the question everyone wants the answer to. I don't know. I mean, in terms of, if you want to look at de it demographically, I guess, and in terms of electability that we've historically known it as, Biden. Um, but I think if you want to go the populist route and go straight up, you know, right there, populist versus populist, maybe it is Sanders. We'll see. Five seconds, Jilly. Yeah, 100% agree. Uh, I think that Biden would be the right choice for the DNC, but uh, I'm, I'm thinking that Sanders will be it. But uh, Biden, 
definitely has the best chance of beating Trump. Sanders is a risky move. All right, Keenan, I'm going to cut you off here. I'm just going to ask you for your prediction. Who wins Iowa tonight? I'm going to say Sanders. All right. We got a fun one here tonight. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining us. We've got a big night of numbers coming up. Unfortunately, that will do it for us here with the election coverage tonight for 20.